All right, guys, today is lesson four. We're going to talk about Chinese power and propaganda. So the two pieces we'll look at are the Forbidden City, which you have five images, which you can see up at the top. And then we have number 212, Chairman Mao and Route to Enyuan. So both have pictures of Mao Zedong. So we'll be talking about him specifically as well. All right, so uh, as we go through this, if you have other questions, because I won't be there to answer them, feel free to jot down notes to yourself so that you remember the things that you wanna recap after the fact. All right, so to begin with, the form of this site, we're gonna talk about the materials a little bit and the construction, and then we're gonna watch a video that will hopefully help clarify some of uh, the details of this place. So the construction of it, it's almost all wood, other than the buildings have large marble slabs underneath to elevate them. Other than that, it's wood, and it's wood construction without glue and without nails. So you can look at the top, the mortise and tenon, which is something that we looked at in multiple places, but in a really basic way, Stonehenge used this technique as well. And with woodwork, it's just more precise, especially for these more contemporary and large scale buildings. Um, around the outside of the whole exterior, there's a moat. This acts as a like focal point and also a protecting layer. And then there's also a man-made river throughout. So you can see that with this curvy line and all of these other pieces indicate bridges that would cross that. Okay, there are also many walls. The outermost is 15 miles long. So this is a very, very large place. And then we also see this central axis all of these buildings, the most important buildings, are aligned in this symmetrical way down the center. Um, the space is also divided into the inner court and outer court as well. So the outer court are all of these front areas. This would be something where more people could access, the common people could uh, come see their leader. And then the inner court is more private, and this is something just reserved for the elites. So I bet you could think about some places where we see that kind of separation um, in our past works as well. As we go through, I want you to think about why this is called the Forbidden City as well um, and how it got that name. Okay, just one more view at this ground plan so you can see it from above. Here's that man-made river and we have our outer gate. We have this kind of inner court. This is Tiananmen Square. And then we have the place, this would be where the emperor could sit to hear his people. And we'll look at that when we talk about content. So that's the Hall of Supreme Harmony. And once again, a large courtyard to accommodate people that are coming. In 1420, in an effort to consolidate his control over the throne, the emperor of the Ming Dynasty moved China's capital to a site in the north now known as Beijing. There, he built a vast complex of palaces and administrative buildings now covering 178 acres. Because access was restricted to members of the imperial family and those serving or having business with them, it came to be known as the Forbidden City. From here, 24 emperors of the Ming and Qing dynasties ruled their vast country for over 500 years. The emperor's new palace took one million workers almost 20 years to construct. Everything from the location of the main buildings on the north-south axis, the colors of roofs and walls, to the number of bosses on doors carries symbolic meaning. The precise design of the palace reflected the order that the emperor was meant to bestow on his empire. A visitor to the Forbidden City would have passed through several gates before reaching the Meridian Gate, the main entrance to the palace. This visitor was then required to enter through one of the smaller side doors. One crossed the River of Golden Water and passed through another gate before approaching the Hall of Supreme Harmony, the largest building in the Forbidden City. Here, military and civil officials lined up for an audience with the emperor. Officials checked that everyone was in the right spot and correctly attired. Then music sounded, and the emperor was carried into the hall in his yellow palanquin. The emperor was traditionally associated with the dragon. Seated on his dragon throne, wearing a dragon robe, 
the emperor represented the apex of the empire. But the daily business of the empire was conducted in the inner court. This was where the emperor, his empress and concubines lived, attended by numerous maidservants and eunuchs. The inner court mirrors the layout of the outer court on a smaller scale, but residences and gardens give it a more intimate feel. Still, all the luxury should not conceal the fact that for the women in the palace, and even the emperor, the Forbidden City was a golden cage. The inhabitants rarely got to leave once they entered. Throughout the Forbidden City, all possible precautions were taken to guard against the greatest danger for its buildings, fire. Animals and figures on the roofs guarded against fires and evil spirits. But all the auspicious symbols and elaborate rituals could not prevent the end of China's empire in 1911. For it was then that six-year-old Pu Yi abdicated the throne. For the first time in China's history, ordinary people were soon able to enter the Forbidden City. The once inaccessible palace is now a museum and a monument to China's glorious past. All right, so hopefully you got a good idea about uh, some of the symbols and things that show wealth within uh, the Forbidden City. So we don't go into detail with like the different figures and sculptural elements on the roofs and like that much detail because more of the focus of what we look at is where uh, the buildings are and the meaning of those different buildings. All right, so... <laughs> But would you like to say hi to my students? Say hi, students. All right, that was my three-year-old. Okay, so anyway, content. So everything is very symbolic. The order, the placement of things is really, really important. So the first thing that we're gonna look at is the meridian. All right, so the meridian gate, this is the one that we see in the top left image here. And it's what you see in the lowest part of the ground plan here. This is the outer gate, the main entry to the Forbidden City with that big wall around it. Okay, there are three openings. So based on status, you'd be able to enter. They're reserved for, like one is just reserved for uh, the emperor of the dynasty. The front gate is this middle one we see here with Mao's portrait. There is this bridge that would go across this Man Reed River and there's a big courtyard. So this would be another place uh, where it kind of separates separate places. And then beyond that, we have the Hall of Supreme Harmony, which you're seeing almost in the middle here. It's much more elevated. It's what you see in the bottom left image here. And the elevation is really important because this is where the emperor would hear from his people. So it's a place where uh, he would, uh, the seat of government that would hear all of the people and it also separates the inner court from the outer court so this would be the last place that the public would be able to enter it's also the largest wooden building in all of uh china at the time and once again we're created with mortise and tenon construction so functionally the all of the forbidden city it's about public perception it's about uh showing the structure of their government all right, so we talked about the public perception um, and then also privately, this is in the inner court. This would be a place for palaces, homes for elites and royals. So there are 90 palaces total in this back area. It's also where all of the administrative parts of the government would function. But if you notice the names, Hall of Central Harmony, Preserving Harmony, Doorway of Heavenly Purity, Palace of Heavenly Purity, Hall of Union, Palace of Earthly Tranquility, Right? It's all to kind of promote a belief about the structure and the peacefulness of the government. Um, and all, it's more propaganda and it's now a museum, so it's no longer functional. All right, so one more image that you'll see, the image to the left, this shows a room inside of the Palace of Tranquility and Longevity, which is at the very back of this inner court, this would be very much reserved just for the emperor and the leadership. But if you look at the ornamentation from ceiling to walls to the ground, 
think of all of the artisans and craftsmen that would be working to create this and everything has meaning from the choice in the images they're all showing the beauty of china um, and detailed ornamentation all right so let's talk about context a little bit so confucianism is a huge part of the design of this place it's also a big part of these later dynasties in the way that they assert control and organization um, over the people so confucianism is an ethical system of behavior in society some people argue it's a religious belief some argue it's a philosophical belief um, i think you could make the argument it's a little bit of both but it's about morals ethics the right way of doing things and so confucianism shows up in this site because of the symmetry, the stability, the order, the fact that the, <clears throat> the leader is only carried up into a building one way, very much ordered and um, organized. Um, one thing I don't think I mentioned with the last slide I wanna go back to is for the Hall of Supreme Harmony here, I don't think I mentioned these staircases. So we have two staircases to the side that the people could go up, but this middle area was just reserved. It's flat here and there's many staircases to the side. This would be where the emperor would be carried up on his like chariot to go to the top. This is another great way to show that power, to show tradition, to show order and um, all of those things that come back to Confucianism just with the way that they created this whole extra space just for him to be carried up in a certain way. Okay, um, a little bit of the history related to the dynasties. So pre before the Ming Dynasty, who the Ming Dynasty is the one that start the Forbidden City, the Yuan Dynasty is driven out. So they were the Mongols, they were foreigners that come in and control most of China and the people. And the Ming Dynasty is the ones who like reassert control under this Confucianist ideology and start building the Forbidden City. Okay, Mao Zedong, we'll talk about a little more when we watch this next video, but he becomes, so this is after the dynasties end in China. So after 1911, when the throne is abdicated, Mao Zedong comes to power shortly after. And if you notice, his image is added to the front of one of these buildings. And there's a lot of reason for that because he tries to continue some of the stability and control and order that has been uh, left by his predecessors. All right, so this video that we're gonna watch is a really nice way for you to kind of get familiar with Mao and his importance in the culture. So the things they talk about, it's good for you to know what how the portrait is important to the Forbidden City where it's displayed, but more so the background they talk about with Mao in power in the like 1900s uh, is related to context for the next piece. So Chairman Mao en route to Anyuan, what they talk about in this video is um, all great con contextual background for that. Regardless of how one views the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese Revolution, Mao Zedong is, for many Chinese, the man who liberated China and laid the foundation for today's great power. Mao Zedong is the legacy of 20th century China. Mao Zedong is always a topic very emotional, not only like a symbolic one. When we talk about 20th century China, it's not possible not to talk about the Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong's importance is reflected in the Chinese Communist Party's ideology, as well as on the Chinese UN banknotes. Everyone who visits Tiananmen Square in Beijing can see the large Mao portrait above the entrance to the Forbidden City, where it has hung since 1949. Up until a few years ago, it was a secret who had actually painted the portrait. This great artist is Mao Zedong. Because in the解放 era, we all learned Mao Zedong's style. We also admired Mao Zedong himself. So this is a very beautiful artist. 
Wang Qijiu was Mao's portraitist for 27 years, a task he inherited from his father. Twice a year, the portrait is exchanged for a new one, and it is still Wang Qijiu who decides what the portrait will look like. Chi 毛主席像是挂在这个国旗跟党旗的旁边中间画一个毛主席像所以一看这红旗你这个脸必须画红一点要不红那可就不好说了这事儿红卫兵没准就早一点吧也担着心<笑> It was not just Mao's portraitist who was frightened by the Cultural Revolution and its strongest symbol, the Red Guards, Mao Zedong's protégés. The Cultural Revolution was Mao Zedong's ultimate political campaign. It began in 1966 and ended with his death in 1976. Mao Zedong's leadership is not called into question as much as his actions are. This is particularly true for the Great Leap Forward at the end of the 1950s. It was intended to rapidly industrialize China, but led instead to the deaths of between 30 and 50 million people from starvation and hardships. This also applies to the Cultural Revolution. Well, there are many reasons for the happening of the Cultural Revolution, of course not. But okay, so minor technical difficulties, but we're back on. So anyway, uh, we just saw a video about Mao and some of the history related to him with the Red Guard, Great Leap Forward, and Cultural Rev Revolution. Remember, both of these works have portraits of Mao within them. But really, for the Forbidden City, this was no longer used as the seat of the government for the dynasties because the dynasties had, had ended, and now the Communist Party comes to power and Mao is the leader of uh, the group. So why, if it's no longer in use, would Mao's portrait be on the front gate of the Forbidden City? Remember, this is still a symbol for the past and the history in China and the legacy and the symmetry shows the balance of the governmental structures, the order. And so it makes sense that Mao would want to put his face on this symbol. Uh, so that's really all related to the Forbidden City and the portrait that is continually replaced. And you heard the artist talking about the red and all of the things to make Mao look like this icon, this very important figure. So if we look at it compared to our next work, Chairman Mao and Route to Anyuan, we see Mao is much younger in the one to the right. He, we have a full body. We also have some landscape. So there's more symbols and more things to dissect than there are in his portrait here. We have a stance of power. We have a fist and he's holding an umbrella. He's also shown in traditional Chinese uh, dress. So all of these things are symbols that are communicating to us. 
All right, so before we dive in any further with looking at the image, some of the things that they talked about in the video that I think are important contextually for this to know are some of the things that happen under Mao. So he's the head of the Communist Party. He starts the Red Guard, which is youth training them to basically enforce his rules. And so they become this like soldier-esque class that are promoted and able to um, enforce the rules. So the Great Leap Forward in the 50s, this is when the farmland of China is converted to make it more industrial. So the idea is very quickly, we are going to make a leap forward in the global economy. And it unfortunately does not work out the way he intends. It leads to a lot of famine, poverty, and death, because a lot of the farmland that grows the crops is converted to industrial areas. A lot of the people that have lived their whole lives as farmers, he's telling them now they have to do different things. And so it's a really, really terrible outcome for this thing that's supposed to be very positive. Then shortly after that, in the 60s to the 70s, uh, this is when the Cultural Revolution starts. So Mao is trying to reassert himself as a leader after the epic failure with the Great Leap Forward. And the Cultural Revolution, think of it as an advertising campaign. It's a way to re-promote and uh, change the narrative of the negatives that happened during the Great Leap Forward. So we have goals of ending criticism of Mao in arts. So now all of a sudden, you're not allowed to critique the leader in the artwork. Um, that was kind of always the case that negative, negative portrayals were not super accepted. But another way that they do this is lots and lots of artists are employed under Mao, and they are the ones that are promoting a certain image. They are the adver advertisers, the ones producing the images that will communicate the most to the people. Um, another goal is to repair damages from the 1950s. So trying to make sure there is enough farmland to support the community, trying to redistribute to make sure that um, things are good. So there are positives that come from it. Um, they're also trying to reinvigorate communist ideology. So using red as a symbol, more propaganda to make sure people forget about the bad parts of the Great Leap Forward and instead remember how awesome Mao is. Um, and then additionally, contextually, I think it's good to remind you about the Tiananmen Square Massacre. massacre. So in 1989, uh, this was a peaceful protest of the government uh, and it was mostly college students and young people out with like a sit-in and Tiananmen Square is that courtyard right at the beginning of so right here um, a little bit further out is where the square is and many many people were gunned down at this peaceful protest so it, it just kind of shows this authoritarian role or branch of the government um, that is kind of lurking behind this positive peaceful image so functionally this piece is propaganda. It's for the masses. Uh, and it was repeated many, many times uh, over and over and over again. So it was an image that they really wanted out there in the community. So people would think about Mao in a certain way instead of maybe for some of the things that didn't go so well in his reign. Okay, so I like to put this image next to the one on the left, which is a painting of Mao. They have similarities, differences, but I'd love for you to take a second, stop the video, and chat about what are some of the things that you see that could be symbols that are trying to tell us something about Mao and his role. All right, so um, the one on the right, very strong, uh, assertive position, uh, not a lot of people, no one around him. The one on the left has lots of people around him, and he's a little bit more casual in his stance. We have... Um, the way that the people are looking at him too. There's this saying with Mao that he is like the sun and all of the people of China are the sunflowers. And if you know about sunflowers, they always face towards the sun, even if it moves across the sky. And so in this way, all of the people framing him are really highlighting his right to rule, his importance, his um, otherworldliness. Okay, other things that you might notice in the picture, there's farmland that looks super fertile, very um, happy people, well-dressed, there's no poverty. And he's, yes, shown in a business suit here, but he also has a hat in his hand, one of the farming hats. 
So he's connected to his people. He's with them. On the right, the one that we have is our image. This one, there's also those symbols. So he said the fist, the umbrella, which shows that he's absolutely ready for anything that might come. We have his clothing, which shows a connection to the past, Chinese history. And if you look at the landscape, it looks so tiny compared to him. He is the, the main figure, the most important one, and he's ready for anything. And that's what we see here. Okay, so we're going to take a second to learn a little bit about lithography and um, this process. Now, this is slightly different because the one that we're looking at shows um, color lithography, but that's just done in layers where this one is just pencil or um, just like one layer with the black and white. Uh, we're at the Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop, started in 1948 by Bob Blackburn. Lithography was invented for the purpose of reproducing sheet music. Instead of writing it once by hand over and over and over and over, Senefelder developed lithography for the purpose of writing that orchestral arrangement one time so it could be reproduced, so that it could be sold to multiple orchestras throughout cities throughout all over Europe. That was its original intention. When an artist gets a hold of something that allows you to work in a new way, they will always take those tools and materials and use them for their own artistic purposes. That was the case for um, engraving, it was the case for relief printing or woodcut, and it's also the case for digital printmaking now. Lithography is based on a very simple principle that grease and water resist one another, and so what you will see is a balance of the plate being dampened and then rolled over with a greasy based ink. It's the same as when you're cleaning dishes, if you've got a really greasy pan and you fill it up with water, you start putting water in it, it starts to pull away from the grease. The exact same thing is happening here, only it's very finely controlled placed grease. One of the things that makes lithography so unique is that it actually is the most autographic of all the printmaking processes. It captures the exact mark of the hand that moves across that surface. As a result, it gains the most clarity from a drawer's perspective, from a direct point of view. All the other printmaking processes translate that mark into other ways versus it just being an absolute record of the movement of the hand in that way. So for drawers, lithography is a very uh, freeing type of drawing process because it can't All right, so when we talk about lithography, I know that was just one that shows the black and white, but this would have been done in layers. And what he was talking about with water and oil, when you draw on the plate, um, what it does with the oil crayon, basically, you put water over it and then you press down um, and it, it recreates the image. And you can do that so many times with the same drawing. Basically, it's, it's like drawing, but being able to reproduce it over and over and over again. So yes, this one is much more complex because of the layering in it, but it was reproduced, as it says here, nine million times. So they would keep using the same drawing and kind of, you have to go back and redraw it over and over again, but it was something that they could reproduce over and over again. Um, so one thing you might've noticed in our ID is that it's based on an oil painting by Liu Chunhua. So this was an older painting of him probably closer to when he was this age, in his 20s or so. Um, and then in his 70s, so when he's at the end of his life, they choose to make this color lithograph of it so that they can repeat it over and over again. Why did they choose this image when he's in his 70s to put out there? Okay, hopefully if you think about it for a second, you think about they're trying to show him at his best. They want to show him youthful. They want to change the narrative of some of the negative things that happen while he's in charge. So forget about the, the great leap forward, the fails. Let's go back to a time when he was a great, great leader and focus on that. And so the story that's depicted here was when a young Mao, when he first comes to uh, power, I think this was before he was even the head of the Communist Party, but it shows him marching towards a coal mine um, that's the image that we're really seeing here. And he's marching there to help organize coal miners to strike. They are not getting fair wages or fair working in, in environments. And so he helps to work with the people to get them what they deserve. Okay. And so by 
showing this, it reminds people of, uh, you know, how great he was and still is. All right, so the landscape, if you look at how big he is in the landscape, that's very intentional. They want him to seem more godly, bigger than the world, the most important thing. Um, he has the stance, the clothing, all of those things we talked about. And the landscape, you can see elements that might remind you of things that we've looked at in Chinese landscapes. Um, this one, which you're doing for homework for tomorrow, this is Travelers Among Mountains and Streams. And so you see that he's kind of, the artists are really relying on some of uh, the traditional ways that art is created in China also. Okay, and you probably would see some of these similarities too. All right, so other than that, we are going to end for today. Um, hopefully you got a better idea of later China, looking at what happens when um, the dynasties create the Forbidden City, Ming Dynasty specifically, and then what happens once that reign ends and when the Communist Party, Pao Party and Mao come to power. Remember, if you had questions or anything, just jot those down and then we'll talk about them again tomorrow.